Hello, thank you all for coming. It's so great to see you. For all of those who are watching, these are the nominees for Outstanding Achievement in Audio Design, representing a wonderful range of game types that I expect this conversation to illuminate uh, the complexities and importance of effective audio design, no matter what genre game it comes from. Uh, first off, we're going to introduce the crew that's here today. Uh, we have Tom Colvin, who is working on Dreams. Thank you so much for being here, Tom. Hi, it's great to be here. Uh, really a great pleasure to be nominated. So thanks for that. Uh, my name Thank is Tom so Colvin. Much. So I've been in game audio for 17 years, I think. And um, I've always been the, the audio lead at, in that time. Um, I was first at Climax, then Ninja Theory, then a little brief time as a colleague of Larson at, at uh, Microsoft, and uh, then over to the other side with Sony and Media Molecule. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just uh, in a sort of strange world of, of uh, user generated content right now with dreams. And uh, yeah, it's been a very interesting last few years. Thank you for being here and thank you for, for, for hanging and rocking with us today. Uh, from Ghost of Tsushima, we have Brad Meyer. How are you doing, Brad? I'm oh, great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Share share a little bit of info for the folks at home about what you've been working on and what you do. I've been working on Ghost of Tsushima. And um, no, um, yeah, so I'm audio director at Sucker Punch and uh, been there for about nine years. Um, and previously was at a startup at Activision, Konami. Um, been doing this for quite a while. Um, and uh, yeah, just super excited to to be here and, and just honored to have my team nominated amidst all these other amazing talents. Thank you again for being here. And from The Last of Us 2, we have Rob Krekel. How are you doing, Rob? Hey, Khalif, how's it going, man? I'm, uh, I'm doing really well. I'm just like my, my, uh, my, my fellows here. I'm, I'm super excited to be nominated and have our team nominated. Uh, you know, all the hard work uh, in The Last of Us Part 2 is, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's behind us, but uh, now we get to enjoy a little bit of the spoils, hopefully. Um, I've been in the games industry for um, over 15 years now, uh, 10 of which have been uh, with Sony and Naughty Dog. I'm the audio director here. I, I um, took over uh, a great lineage from um, a couple of audio directors who have been here previously, and I stand on the shoulders of giants, as they say. And uh, I'm just uh, I'm stoked to be nominated and um, happy to be here to have a chat. Well, thank you again for, for, for coming through and for, for hanging with us for, for the awards. It's super, super appreciated. Uh, Ori and Will of the Wisps, we have Christopher Larson. How are you doing, Christopher? Good. How are you? Um, good, good, good. Excited to, for you to be here. I'd love for you to share a little bit of info about your work in the space. Sure. Uh, again, like everyone, super thrilled uh, to be nominated. Um, and uh, I've been in the industry for many moons now. Um, and I've worked on both sides of the fence. I've worked at uh, um, console uh, publishers and developers and third party tools and been the audio guy and, uh, you know, everywhere in between. And uh, currently I'm at uh, Formosa Interactive, uh, where uh, I'm so happy to be able to work with the majority of uh, my uh, compatriots here uh, in one form or another. Um, and uh, uh, we were really thrilled to be able to uh, work on uh, on Ori with Moon Studios, and uh, it's it's great. I get to work with so many great people, both uh, internally and externally. So very excited to be here. Well, thank you so much for for being here. We really do appreciate it. And last but not least, we have Jay Waters, who worked on Sackboy: A Big Adventure. Thank you so much for being here, Jay. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've been, um, I'm audio director at Sumo Sheffield. I've been there about nine years now. Um, I joined when the company originally took over the little big planet franchise. Um, um, and prior to that, I did about six years at team 17. Very, very cool. So, so again, thank you all for being here. Uh, this is a really fun uh, conversation and category to talk about because it's such a wide, uh, uh, you know, big library of things that we can dig into and, and talk about. Um, you know, one of the kind of initial questions I want to share with the room and, and ask for from all of you is, you know, with the variety of games that we kind of see nominated here, you know, what are some kind of common 
tenants that, the, that these games kind of share? What are some of the things that from an audio design uh, perspective you're kind of seeing as a part of the narrative across these games or, or, or things that you're thinking about in terms of the games that you've made that fit directly with maybe some of the stuff that we see kind of nominated today? I'm going to go to you, Brad, first. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to yeah, jump into would, the pot. I would you. say each of these games has an exceptional uh, personality to them. And I think that personality is very much kind of uh, presented sonically, you know, from, you know, the, the more kind of cartooniness of Sackboy to this kind of otherworldly beauty of, of Dreams or Ori to the kind of gritty realness of, of Pilu and, and Ghost. It's, they all kind of live and die by how the audio kind of matches the gameplay, the tone, the feel. And so, you know, no matter what game you're working on, that that's always the the most critical thing that you're hitting is 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 the audio doing the service of of selling the world and bringing it to life. Yeah, Jay, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on on that as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, what Brad said is is pretty dead on, really. I mean, there's there's quite um a difference between um something like Sackboy and say ghosts or last of us but yeah i think each each game has its own identity and i think the audio's you know job is really to support that where best it can yeah i'm kind yeah. of curious as well oh go ahead i'm sorry jump in oh well i was i was going to um uh comment that i noticed that that uh, for all the nominated games there's a they, they definitely do have their own character they also um they're they're relatively complex as well mm. there's there have been trends you know where there's like the the kind of 8-bit you know um really cool really stylistic stuff it's it's great but sometimes a little limited in um in in the visual and the audio and i've noticed that uh for these nominees we definitely have uh, a lot of uh complexity uh involved in the systems and the presentations uh even, and they all come out as a whole so whether it's you know the 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 deep kind of um minis, you know minutia that you see in like uh last of us per se or the um yeah the kind of uh uh the systems that we created for ori or that you you know what you need to do for dreams and Sackboy as far as user you know generate content it's no small feat but everything that we do when it actually comes out it's it's a very holistic uh presentation it's not this conglomeration of all these uh systems it's really a a piece of art that comes out at the end and i think that you know that's where we all have been able to uh, you know where our expertise has really uh, been able to shine is to be able to make it come into a cohesive piece of art yeah, I love the fact that you kind of touched on the complexity of, you know, th the games that we have nominated here in terms of their audio design and the things that you all have to kind of, you know, think about, mitigate, and also kind of incorporate into the whole audio scape in that way. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts about that, Rob, about, you know, thinking about not only these games, but the game that you worked on, the kind of, you know, breadth and depth of the complexity of, of kind of how do you make sure that everything gets its due in its way? And how do you make sure that when you're thinking about the, the way it, it kind of displays itself for the player, that those, those pieces kind of, you know, shine through when they need to. Yeah. I mean, the, the depth at which games nowadays, it, it kind of doesn't matter. It's kind of what Chris was saying. It doesn't really matter. The, the style, the, the technical complexity is something that is only getting bigger and bigger and bigger as mm -hmm. platforms, uh, you know, increase in their ability to, to give us horsepower to play with um, our sort of technical ambition grows. And um, for, for a game like the last of us part two, what that means is um, we can really try to focus in on all the small little details that make a world come alive. And the goal of that is not necessarily to show off technical prowess or show off, oh, we hit all these little details. It's more that it becomes invisible to players and they just mm. are enveloped by the experience. Um, that's always the goal, especially with audio. The best audio is often the stuff you don't notice. It's the stuff mm. that just makes it feel right. That, that feeling of, of immersion often comes from, from audio and from sound design. Um, and then music obviously is a huge part of the emotional component of things. 
and and games have a unique challenge with music in that we're trying to pull the emotional heartstrings when uh, the player has almost always control of what's going on in the game. And so that presents unique challenges across the board. And you know, as technology evolves, we get more tools to play with to make that uh, a lot better. I, I would assume, and this this one is directed at you, Tom. I would assume that with a game where you have a lot of user generated content, that that complexity then jumps tenfold in how you kind of figure out how to you know, initially kind of pull in all that good goodness into the into the fold. I'm curious about, you know, how you went about curating these libraries for both music and sound design, and, and yes. what was the inspiration behind these kind of various palettes that you wind up playing with. It was, it's, uh, yeah, it was challenging. I will say definitely challenging. Um, I mean, for, for most of my career, as the rest of you will have done, we spend our time thinking about here is a, a piece of entertainment and I'm, I've got these resources and I'm going to concentrate on getting the best result that I possibly can and serving the vision and making people feel that the whole thing's come alive and I'm in the world and so on. And, and, and we've all had a, a career doing that. And the challenge with dreams is like, okay, now I've got to dissolve the bits of that career and professional experience <laughs> into in itself to something that is entertaining and fun, but also satisfying for people like me who actually really care about like the tiny little details and the complexity that we've all just been discussing. I mean, the complexity brings us all to that richness that we want because we know that detail is what create makes a, a uh, an entertaining experience people won't appreciate the level of detail that goes in i'm sure but then also with dreams we had to think but but i i need i need it to make i need to make it fun for people that have literally no idea how to do anything with sound and possibly people that don't even care about sound at all and don't want to care they still want to be able to make something and have a fun experience making it and and make it sound good and um so a massive part of that is, well, it's just diluting all the bits of um, an audio person's career into fun chunks. So there's a, a bit, part of it is your audio library, like all of you will feel you know, greatly at home and happy about the fact that you've got terabytes, literally, of a database that you can get. I want that thing, but I want that flavor <laughs> of that thing. And I remember that time five years ago when I recorded <laughs> that thing, and I actually want that little bit there. And I'm not going to say, well, okay, now I've got to, deliver that part to an audience um so yeah and the same with music and the same with recording things and the same with playing around with effects and like all the different bits of a career so yeah and i think we just decided to craft all of those sections in in a way that appealed to us first i think we just made ourselves the first customers of it mm. um because i think that's the i think with all of us that's the the gauge first of all you satisfy yourself first because otherwise your own sort of creative compass is not aligned and then but then also we spend a lot of time like giving it to people who as i've just said who literally have no idea what to do and you know i think yeah it's it's, it's a very tricky balance it's been a tricky balance but i hope people get the, you know in, an enjoyment out of it that they haven't previously expected like i'll just give you one little example that i like yeah please which is that um the one of the tutorials is the first tutorial for like how do I music I've never done music before and now I'm gonna learn music in dreams and dreams is gonna say how do I do it uh, and so it's kind of we, we just gave people like a sort of a, a jigsaw approach you like okay here's you know some bits of music they're all pre-made and we put all of our time and effort and love into making them all work together all of them so they're all in the same key they're all fitted so that they will all work together there's several i've forgotten how many hundred different little clips short clips and you can <laughs> assemble them yourself and then put them on a timeline and stretch them out and and that's i think people spend more hours in that tutorial than anything else i think uh, it's been it's been something that people really love and that that's been the real great joy is just watching people discover the thing that i care about Sorry, I'm going oh, on, but anyway, I mean, yeah. I mean, once I great. Yeah, I mean, I mean, once I found the, the the certain bells that I was looking for, 
yeah. to, to make my beat sound really, really good. That was the thing that I was like, I need to make sure that I incorporate that in most of the other stuff that I have. If I, it's, it is, it is very difficult to, to amass all that stuff and then try to figure out good ways to, to keep the player, you know, invested in, you know, not only the tools that you've kind of given, but the ones that are kind of always going to be available moving forward. Once more people start to, uh, you know, add, add, add seasoning to, to, to the pot. Um, mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious about that in terms of the work that you've done, Jay, with, with Sackboy, a big adventure, you know, you've, you all used to use the host of kind of subtle sound effects that, that also kind of create haptic feedback. You know, uh, I'm, I'm curious about what the design philosophy behind that audio kind of helped players navigate and succeed in their ad adventures that they kind of gone through in that game. Um, it, it's kind of funny, actually, because um, coming off of um, previous Little Big Planets, we've yeah. kind of gone the other way, you know, and having to focus on creating sound effects that the players can use in their own creations to, in this one, being the first opportunity to actually, you know, basically create bespoke sound effects throughout the entire game. Um, in terms of de design philosophy, um, I guess this was, there was a big focus really on how we can bring a, a level of harmony to the experience. Um, and a key part of that being that um, we really wanted to look at ways in which we could um, integrate sound effects um, much more closely with the music. Um, so we kind of, um, we took a, quite a number of key gameplay sounds, which were very tonal in nature and often um, fairly melodic in composition. Um, and we, we, we built some systems whereby designers could implement those sounds so they would uh, be in tune with the music. So we're kind of constantly tracking the key of the music um, throughout each of the levels. Um, and yeah, so certain key um, player feedback sounds anyway, uh, generally um, keep in tune with the music. Yeah. I've also been amazingly impressed at how well you've gotten big sounds through a teeny speaker in the dual sense that sound really crisp and clear too. I felt, always found that to be uh, a thing that I kind of marvel at when I play that game is like, wow, you figured out a way to kind of work some of that stuff through and have it kind of play together in this, in those spaces that feels really, really good. Um, um, yeah. In, in terms of the, um, the dual sense, we, we kind of made a point of, of designing sounds for that that were that were going to complement the on-screen um, audio rather than you know just channeling the same sounds through that. So yeah, so we you kind of playing to the advantage of the small speaker rather than just throwing anything through it really. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 brilliant in the way it was implemented, and and it it, it really does add this layer of immersion that I didn't expect. And, you know, with new hardware coming up and, and and having that be a part of the mix is is, is something that was super 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 cool. Um, Rob, I want, I want to ask you a question about gross noises. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask you a question about, you know, uh, what was some of the thought process in, you know, this iconic sound that has now come about with, you know, the, the sounds of the clickers and, and the kind of, you know, some of the factions that are in that game. You know, the, one of the kind of most harrowing and scary things about, about the, the game is the, the kind of whistling language that has come from some of the, the, the enemies that have been in the space. I'd love for you to, to share and elaborate a little bit about, you know, what the process was, was thinking about kind of giving them this verbal language that now evokes different kinds of emotions that, that you don't really have an expectation for. And then how did you build upon that to kind of, you know, make that all work so that the player has this different feel uh, whenever you wind up coming against those? I mean, uh, for the, for the infected, a lot of our, our challenges were, you know, keeping to the the expectations of players from what was created in the first game, we had major technical challenges in that our animation system is completely different. And so the way that we play those things back in game, totally different from the first game. So we had to kind of go back to the, the drawing board. And, um, you know, we are fortunate we get to work with such amazing uh, voice actors and creature actors to give us uh, a base for all of the disgusting noises that are required to uh, to set the mood for those infected encounters. Um, really, for us, it was it was staying true to the original game and 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 making sure that it technically worked uh, with all of our new systems. The the whistling, on the other hand, was was something that from the beginning of the the development for the Seraphites, um, we we as a studio wanted to have a different vibe for them entirely. Um, that was much more um, sort of primal in nature. And 
we did a bunch of research into actual whistle languages to mm. be inspired and understand that it is possible to communicate various things with whistles. Most people think of whistles as, as fairly simplistic, but um, they're actually extremely flexible and they travel a great distance. So they're really great for, for communication, especially in a, in a sort of tactical scenario in which you find yourself uh, when you're fighting against them. But it had the added benefit of, of having this creepy, really disturbing way of freaking the player out because the whistles are all <laughs> tied into a system. They're, they're saying the same things as the other bad guys you fight, the other human uh, enemies that you fight in the game. It's just they're using whistles to say those things. So if the player is, is so inclined, they can actually decode the whistle system and understand exactly what is going on if, if, they, if they so choose. So it's one of those things where it freaks you out initially, but if you're, uh, if you're really invested in, in trying to figure out exactly what those whistles mean, you can figure it out. And there's a real language there. We actually developed a, a, a language so that it makes sense. It's not random. The stuff is, uh, is done intentionally. That's amazing. That's Can I ask a question? Awesome. Sorry to butt in. I'm just <laughs> no, please, I'm please, please jump in. <laughs> Did you guys uh, write a script which you then translate into whistle, but you had like the real things? Like, your, the, was it at that level or? So yeah. So like the the enemies have a script yes. for their their callouts, their barks, whatever uh, you know, whatever word you guys are familiar with for for enemy dialogue during combat. Um, and then we then took that script and our amazingly talented dialogue folks. Um, we recorded a bunch of temp stuff and we pieced things together with just people here at the studio. And once we found something that worked by playtesting, then we actually hired some, some real uh, high quality whistlers <laughs> so that they could <laughs> perform, the, perform the whistles you know, with greater accuracy. But the other thing that we had them do is variety. So, um, so that it's not the same whistle every time. And it also, you know, not, every can, not everyone can whistle exactly the same or with the exact same power or prowess. So some of the whistles, like you may hear a whistle that's like slightly off pitch or slightly less powerful. That's because we're trying to represent like multiple different people actually utilizing these whistles. It's not just one group of whistles that gets spread across every enemy. There was actually like different characters um, with different sort of like proficiency level, I would say. Um, and that was something that we, yeah, that we, we decided on pretty early because we thought it would make it sound more realistic and, and less sort of robotic. I kind of want to feel like you had an American Idol of whistlers at some point and you were like great whistlers on that wall okay whistlers you go over here we'll you know we, 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 did, we did uh we did audition quite a few and the first whistler we got she had this beautiful whistle it was extremely musical and it was delicate yeah. and it was lovely it was everything we didn't want this the seraphite <laughs> whistles to be so it was like wow you're really amazing at whistling but it's just not what we need I, I want that to be the, the 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 feedback when that person left was like, I'm sorry, but you whistle too nicely. That's kind of what your was, whistle yeah. your whistle is way too pretty for this game. <laughs> That's kind of fantastic. Um, Brad, I, I want I want to dig into another sort of you know uh, very very necessary sound that goes along in Ghost of Tsushima, and that that's kind of more in line with horses. You know, the the horse is a huge character within that game, it plays a very prominent part of, of how you traverse the world and, and, and how you deal with that. And also the idea of the wind guiding you uh, to wherever you need to go in terms of, you know, moving towards next objectives and things like that. Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, what it was like to capture those kinds of noises and those kinds of sounds, especially around, around the Foley for horses and things like that, because I think that's super nerdy and interesting i'd love to hear a little bit about that and then you know when did you all kind of think about using the wind and the sound that goes along with that to kind of help the player be guided through through the story yeah so for the wind that was something that um one of the creative direct directors uh, jason Connell, came up with and it started with he had the idea of like what if we could use wind as a navigation tool and then talking to our lead programmer Adrian Bentley to see, can we do that? And then talking to our lead BFX, can we do that? And then um, the prototype was like, that's pretty compelling. So then we started thinking about, okay, how are we gonna do this on the sound side? And so we, we designed the system of like, you know, spline, like sounds moving along splines in the direction of your objective, kind of matching the visuals. And that worked really well. 
the real challenge came with how do we make, like we already have wind in the game just for the ambience of the world. That's really kind of what helps you identify where you are as far as like what biome you might be in. You know, you can close your eyes and hear I'm in grassland or I'm in a bamboo forest or whatever. So we needed some kind of wind that was going to also stand out from kind of our, our ambient wind in the world. Um, and, you know, fortunately kind of the, the narrative of this guiding wind that the player uses to traverse through the world is, you know, Jin asking the spirit of his father imbued in his sword, like for for help. So, so we kind of took that as the the like kind of guiding design principle for the sound and said, you know, why don't we make this something a little bit more tonal, so that way it'll stand out from the rest of the wind. And so, um, Josh Lord, who's my senior sound designer, and I basically went into our, our foley room, and I just to go back to whistling, I played a all of our flute collection that we have at work really poorly and you know just kind of essentially <laughs> just trying to get wind going through and making really kind of bizarre otherworldly ethereal whistles and so then he took all that stuff and mixed in some whispers and some other kind of things that were indicative of like you know a personification of wind rather than wind itself and and that once we got that in it was like oh this is it you can hear it you know that this is is the guiding wind versus the ambient wind and and that was that was kind of the the big moment there um as far as the horses the horses are kind of cool because i think the horse is like the one area where probably almost every sound designer that worked on the game worked in some way on horses. Um, huh. It started with, um, I did a bunch of research and found this natural horsemanship place uh, kind of near near us and outside of Seattle. And so went and recorded a bunch of stuff there. And, you know, these horses, they don't have horseshoes. So we felt that was period appropriate for 13th century Japan and got them walking and, and trotting and galloping over different surfaces and lots of vocalizations. Um, a horse farted and my microphone wasn't close enough. So we just missed out on that. But um, <laughs> so we started with that. And then... Um, and then from there, it was just a lot of, of iteration to really dial it in. Um, you know, we've recorded a lot of, of bridle and saddle stuff. And then uh, we relied on the, the Sony PlayStation team down in San Diego because they have a lot of great fully props to record some more stuff for us. Um, and it was just continually refining what we had and just making sure that, you know, each surface was cutting through the mix. And you know, we ended up going for, um, you know, we had different... Uh, surfaces, different, you know, walk speed types, but then we also had these additional layers of like sweeteners for each surface, just kind of give a little bit more detail so that, you know, occasionally when you're walking on a wooden bridge, it's going to be creaking and you're getting a little bit more grit when he's working, walking on stone and, and those kinds of things. Um, and then on the vocalization side, the initial plan was, hey, let's make every horse sound unique because that'd be really cool. And then as we recorded horses, we found out that they all sound pretty darn similar. So, so what we ended up with was like, okay, the, the player's horse will have a set of vocalizations and then all other horses, the Mongol horses, the you know random horses in the world, the nags, all those will have a different set. So at least we have a little bit of differentiation so that you can grow close to your horse who we may or may not do something to later. Um, and, uh, and then all the other horses sound the way they do. So, so you have to basically figure out a way to get the vo the horses to get vocal cords. Yeah. And so, you know, <laughs> it was actually interesting. So we got like a lot of the, Hey, I'm nervous stuff from the horses by just sticking our, our microphone in front of them because, you know, there are right. these big furry blimps and it's a foreign object. So when the horse sees a foreign object, they get a little bit nervous and they start making these nervous vocalizations. So that works for about 15, 20 minutes. And then we're like, oh, it's that fuzzy thing. Right. And they don't care anymore. So that's how we got those. And then to get a lot of the whinnies and nays, uh, this guy took these two horses that are always together and just separated them and just moved one away. And the other huh. one was like, where's my friend? And he started getting upset. So he he gave us some good, good nays. And I'm really upset whinnies and stuff. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I, I love hearing the kind of like behind the scenes ways of all that kind of stuff works because you never you never think about that while you're playing it and you're just like oh that took a lot of work to almost get that horse fart uh that didn't come through <laughs> on, in in the in the game uh christopher wow. I'm, I'm really interested to hear you know your thoughts around ori um and you know since that game has such a unique look and and 
in how it kind of presents itself. How does the kind of audio design bring more dimension uh, to such a really beautiful environment? Well, that was that was the big you know challenge for us. Uh, it was um, you know we were we were also standing on the shoulders of giants in that um, the previous uh, title was you know it was done exceptionally well. And it, you know, looked great, sounded great. Uh, it had a very painterly uh, look to it. So when Moon wanted to, um, you know, make the next one, uh, they they sort of wanted to, you know, keep, you know, they wanted to keep what was good and just sort of add to it and embellish it. Um, so you know, that was actually our challenge because there was a a very um, creative painterly approach to the first one, and so it's like, how do you add all these rich details? Uh, to, you know, sort of, you know, plus up the experience for the next generation. Um, and uh, we did have one of the benefits of uh, almost all of the uh, uh, enemies and characters and the, um, the environments were new. So we didn't, you know, we were able to um, sort of reference the original aesthetic uh, while making, you know, diving in and creating the details without being sort of shackled by the past, mm. uh, which was, you know, it's, it's actually a really great combination uh, because then you can you can use these kind of gestures to reference things, but you can then also go, um, you know, in whatever direction that you want that's, you know, appropriate for the title. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, there is a lot of dimension to the game, to the to the depth of the art and the, the graphics. I mean, it's just phenomenal looking. Um, but in its gameplay, it's essentially a, a 2D game. Uh, it's, mm. you know, it's a side scroller or it's, you know, side and up and down. Um, so we actually did uh, take advantage of the benefits of spatial audio, uh, which uh, allows us to actually add a, um, a depth so we could actually kind of create the the Z dimension, um, and uh, we could sort of uh, surround the player uh, with uh, a lot of details that you don't necessarily see and you don't you know, need to see, but we're helping create the illusion. We're sort of playing to the depth that is in this 2D world that you can't really go explore, but you can kind of see it around the corner and you can kind of hear it uh, uh, you know, deep in there or behind you or mm. above you. And uh, so the combination of that and, um, uh, and then working with the music and you know, making sure that there was always a, uh, we're you know, working with the uh, composer uh, Gareth was great. The music has always been a huge aspect of Ori and so we never wanted to get in the way of it. And he also really respects sound design. So we were really able to do a, a very symbiotic, uh, you know, um, treatment to the soundscape as a whole to make sure that each of us had our own space to play in and that we weren't either getting in, you know, in each, in each other's way or where we were actually, you know, helping. Uh, so like we would, uh, we would actually sort of reserve some, um, frequency ranges and, uh, articulations, uh, in, in areas so that, sound design and music could live harmoniously together and so we're not like you know fighting with each other over the same mm. fader <laughs> um, mm -hmm. yeah i mean and you all nailed that part you know you, you sharing that information in that way and now thinking about when i was playing it of how much that actually did come through is is, is brilliant so you know thank you for, for all that wonderful work that you all did on that it, it did really come through and, and now i'm thinking about it i'm like oh yeah that did work <laughs> that was super super good um it is now time to to give away our award uh and the dice award for outstanding achievement in audio design goes to goes to tsushima congratulations congratulations awesome. congratulations wow awesome Thank awesome you. awesome congrats awesome. well deserved uh, thanks Jeez, wow. Um, that's a huge honor. And again, especially to be nominated among all these people. Um, and, uh, you know, I will say until I'm blue in the face that uh, this was absolutely a tremendous team effort. Um, both the, the Sucker Punch audio team, the Sony sound design team, Sony music and dialogue teams, um, 
our external partners at Lillinaire who did our cinematics, um, our QA team, and everybody at Sucker Punch as well, because you know we've got a really great team there, and and I have uh, bribed them into listening. Uh, for audio and giving feedback about audio and so it's just such a, a tremendous achievement for all of us and uh what a big honor thank you so much well again tom brad rob christopher and jay thank you thank you so much for being here again thank you for all the wonderful work that you do in the space you know uh, audio design is is very much about the details and you have nailed them in the games that you've you've made in, in, in the space and in, in the world today. And it's so, so comes through uh, and has made everything so much better. So thank you all for your wonderful work and for using your talents for, for all these wonderful games. And uh, we hope to have you back here for another Dice Awards next year. That would be amazing and super, super awesome. Thanks again for, for being here.